This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlord of Kor by Terry Carr Chapter 5 They had some trouble getting cooperation from Horn on any further mine-probing. The Herlogy lived among some of the ruins out on the flat, where the winds threw dust and sand against the weathered stone walls, leaving them worn, smooth, and rounded. The aliens kept these buildings in some state of repair, and there was a communal garden of the planet's dark, fungoid plant life. As Ryanson and Mara strode between the massive buildings, they passed several of the huge creatures. One or two of them turned, and regarded the couple with dull eyes, and went on slowly through the grey shadows. They found Horn sitting motionlessly at the edge of the cluster of buildings, gazing out over the flat toward the low hills which stood black against the deep blue of the horizon sky. Ryanson lowered the telepather from his shoulder and approached him. The alien made no motion of protest when Ryanson hooked up the interpreter, but when the earthman raised the mic to speak, Horn's dry voice spoke in the silence of the thin air, and the machine's stylus traced out, "'There is no purpose.' Ryanson paused for a moment, then said, "'We're almost finished with our reports. We should finish today.' "'There is no purpose, meaning quest.' "'No purpose to the report?' Ryanson said after a moment. "'It's important to us, and we're almost finished. There would be even less purpose in stopping now, when so much has been done.' Horn's large, leathery head turned towards him, and Ryanson felt the ancient creature's heavy gaze on him like a shadow. "'We are accustomed to that.' "'We don't think alike,' Ryanson said to him. "'To me there is a purpose. Will you help me once more?' There was no answer from the alien, only a slow nodding of his head to one side, which Ryanson took for assent. He motioned Mara to set up the telepather. After their last experience Ryanson could understand the creature's reluctance to continue. Perhaps even his statements that there was no purpose to the Earthman's researches made sense, for could the codification of the history of a dying race mean much to its last members? Probably they didn't care. They walked slowly through the ruins of their world, and felt all around them fading, and the jumbled past in their minds must be only one more thing that was to disappear. and Ryanson had not forgotten the terrified waves of hatred which had blasted at him from Horng's mind, nor had Horng, he was sure. Mara connected the leads of the telepather, while the alien sat motionlessly, his dark eyes only occasionally watching either of them. When she was finished, Ryanson nodded for her to activate the linkage. Then there was a rush of Horng's mind upon his, the dim thought-streams growing closer, the grayed images becoming sharper and washing over him, and in a moment he felt his own thoughts merge with them, felt the totality of his own consciousness blend with that of Horng. They were together. They were almost one mind. In Horng he heard the whisper of distrust, of fear and the echoes of that hatred which had struck at him once before. But they were in the background. All around him here on the surface was a pervading feeling of uselessness, resignation, almost of unreality. The calm which he had noted before in Horn had been shaken and turned, and in its place was this fog of hopelessness. Tentatively, Ryanson reached for the racial memories in that grey mind, feeling Horng's own consciousness heavy beside him. He found them, layers of thoughts of unknown aliens still alive here, the pictures and sounds of thousands of years past. He probed among them, looking again for the memories of Tebron, and found what he was searching for. He was Tebron, 
marching across the vast flat which he had seen before, the winds alive around him among the shuffling feet of his army. He felt the muscles of his massive legs tight with weariness, and tasted the dryness of the air as he drew in long gasps. He was still hours from the city, but they would rest before dawn. Ryanson turned among these memories, moving forward in them, and was aware of Horn watching him. There was still the wariness in his mind, and a stir of anxiety, but it was blanketed by the tired hopelessness he had seen. He reached further in the memories, and— The temple guard fell in the shadows, and one of his own warriors stepped forward to retrieve his weapons. The remains of the guard's body— rolled down three, four, five of the steps of the temple, and stopped. His eyes lingered on that body for only a moment, and then he turned, and went up to the entrance. There was a moaning of pain, or of fright, rising somewhere in his head. He was only partly aware of it. He walked into the shadows of the doorway and paused, but only for a moment. There was no movement inside, and he stepped forward, down one step, into the interior. Screams echoed through the halls and corridors of the temple, high and piercing, growing in volume as they echoed, buffeting him almost into unconsciousness. He knew they were from Horn, but he fought them, watching his own steps across the dark inner room. He was Tebron Marl, king, priest, ruler of all Herlage, in the temple of Kor, and he could feel the stone solid beneath his feet. Sweat broke out on his back. His own or Tebron's. But he was Tebron, and he fought the blast of fear in his mind as though it were a battle for his very identity. He was Tebron. The screaming faded, and he stood in silence before the altar of Kor. So this is the source, he thought. For how many days had he fought toward this? It was useless to remember— the muscles of his body were remembrance enough, and the scar tissue that hindered the movement of one shoulder. If he remembered those battles, he would again hear the fading echoes of enemy minds dying within his, and he had had enough of that. This was the goal, and it was his. Perhaps there need be no more such killing. He opened his mouth, and spoke the words which he had learned so many times before, during his apprenticeship in the region of the mines. The rituals of the temple were always conducted in the ancient spoken language. Kor demanded it, and only the priest-caste knew these words, for they were so old that their form had changed almost completely, even by the time his people had developed telepathy and discarded speech. They were not communicated to the rest of the people. I am Tebron Marl, king, priest, leader of all Herlage. I await your order's guidance. He knelt, according to the ritual, and gazed up at the altar. The eye of Kor blinked there, a small circle of light in the dark room. The altar was simple but massive. Its heavy columns, built upon the traditional lines, supported the weight of the eye. He watched its slow waxing and waning, and waited. Within him, Ryanson's mind stirred. And Kor spoke. Remain motionless. Do not go forward. He felt a child as a wave of sensitivity spread through all his skin and his organs sped for a moment. Then it was true. In the temple of Kor, the god-leader really did speak. I await further words. The eye held his gaze almost hypnotically in the dimness. The voice sounded in the huge arched room. The science's quests of your race lead you to extinction. The knowledge words offered to me by your priests make it clear that within a hundred years your race will leave its planet. You must not go forward, for that way lies the extermination of all your race. His mind swam. This was not what he had expected. The god-leader Kor had always aided his people in their sciences. 
In the knowledge word offerings they reported to the eye the results of their studies, and often, if asked properly, the god-leader would clarify uncertainties which they faced. But now he ordered an ending to research quests. This was unthinkable. Knowledge was godhood. Godhood was knowledge. Of the essence, the essence was knowing, understanding. To him, to his people, it was a unity— and now that unity repudiated itself. Faintly in the darkness, somewhere, he again heard screaming. "'Are we to abandon all progress? Are the stars so dangerous?' "'The concept, wish, of progress must die within your people. There must be no purpose in any field of knowledge. You must remain motionless, consolidate what you have, and live in peace.' The eye in the dimness seemed larger and brighter the longer he looked at it. All else in the echoing room was darkness. "'The stars are not dangerous, but there is a race which rises with you, and it rises more rapidly. Should you expand into the stars, you will only meet that race sooner, and they will be stronger. They are more warlike than your people. Already you are capable of peace, and that must be your aim. Remain on your world.' Consolidate. Cultivate the fruits of your civilization as it is, but do not go forward. In that way you will have five thousand years before that race finds you, and if you are no threat to them, they will not destroy you. He felt a rising anger in him as the god-leader's words came to him in the dark room, and a fear that lay deeper. He was a warrior and a quester. How could he give up all such pursuits— and how could he be expected to force all his people to do the same? There would be no hope, wish of advance, no curiosity, no purpose. "'Is this other race so much more advanced than we are?' he asked. He heard a low humming from the altar, and the eye grew brighter again. "'They are not so much ahead of you now, but they are more warlike, and will therefore develop more quickly.' In both your races war is a quest, which you use as a release for what is in you. Your sciences, questings, and your wars are the same thing. You must suppress both. They are discontentment, and you will find that only in peace, if at all. He dipped his head to one side. A gesture of acquiescence or agreement. He couldn't argue with the god-leader core, and he had been wrong even to think of it. How am I to suppress the race? Is it possible to convince each of them of the necessity for abandoning, forgetting, all questing? The eye hummed, and it grew brighter against the darkness of the carved wall behind it, but it was some time before Kor spoke again. It would be impossible to convince every one. The reasons must be kept from them, and kept from the shared memories. You must not communicate my knowledge words in any way. Consolidate your power, force peace upon them, and lead them into acceptance. The knowledge questing can be made to die within them. Remember that there will be no purpose. In that they must find contentment. The king-priest-leader of all Herlage waited a moment, and was ready to rise and leave, when the eye spoke again. You must abolish the priesthood. The knowledge which I have given you must die when you die. He waited for a long time in the dim, suddenly cold hall for the god-leader to speak again, then slowly rose and walked to the door, the image of the eye of Kor still bright in his vision. He stopped outside the doorway, hearing the soft wind of the city flowing slowly past the stone archway above him. One of his guards reached out and touched his mind tentatively but he blocked his thoughts and strode heavily down the steps past them. The sound of the wind above him rose to a screaming, and suddenly it was as though he were tumbling down the entire length of the stairway, fragments of sky and stone and faces flashing past in a kaleidoscope, and the screaming all around him. He almost reached for his bludgeon, but then he realized that he was not Tebron Marl, he was Lee Ryanson and the screaming was horn, and he was being driven out of those thoughts, tumbling through a thousand memories so fast he could not grasp any one of them. He withdrew from Horn's mind as though from a nightmare. 
he became aware of his own body, lying in the dust of Herlage, and he opened his eyes and motioned weakly to Mara to break the connection. When she had done so, he slowly sat up and shook his head, waiting for it to clear. For a while he had been an ancient king of Herlage, and it took some time to return to the present, to his own consciousness. He was dimly aware of Mara kneeling beside him, but he couldn't make out her words at first. "'Are you all right? Are you sure? Look up at me, Lee, please!' He found himself nodding to reassure her, and then he saw the expression on her face and felt the last wisps of alien fog clearing from his mind. There were tears in her eyes, and he touched the side of her face with his hand and said, "'I'm all right, but why don't you kiss me or something?' She did, but before Ryanson could really immerse himself in it, she broke away and said, "'You must have had a bad time with him. It was as though you were dead.' He grinned, a trifle sheepishly, and said, "'Well, it was engrossing. You'd best unhook the beast. He had a bad time of it, too.' Mara rose and removed the wires from Horn gingerly. Ryanson remained sitting. Some of the meaning of what he had just experienced was coming to him now. It certainly explained why the Herlogy had suddenly passed from their war era into lasting peace, and why the memories had been blocked. But could he credit those memories of a voice of an alien god? And sitting in the dust, at the edge of the vast Herlage plain, the full realization came to him, as it could not when he had been Tebron. Not only the temple— but the altar of Kor itself had been unmistakably the workmanship of the outsiders. End of chapter 5